All right. Let us begin. Uh, if we're going to go with Benjamin Franklin references, we're going to start with a lightning talk. Uh, if you don't know why that is a reference, <laughs> Google it later. Uh, I'd like to introduce uh, my close colleague, Andy Carvin, who is the Thank managing you. editor of the Digital Forensic Research Lab. Thanks, Graham. I appreciate it. So I have the honor of managing a team of nearly 20 researchers and editors across five continents. They spend their days hunting disinformation campaigns and influence operations, trying to track down war criminals with open source evidence, and essentially using everything in their power to get to the truth and teach other people how to do the same. I'm honored by the fact that almost all of them are here today. You'll get a chance to meet them in different sessions. In fact, we're going to have uh, a, a current colleague and a former colleague uh, in this lightning talk talking about some of our most recent work uh, in Ukraine and Russia. Having said all that, we are one person short. Uh, we are one person short because our colleague, Roman Osadchuk, is in Ukraine and has been in Ukraine since the beginning of the war. As you may know, uh, the government declared martial law soon after the invasion, and as part of that declaration, they said fighting age males may not leave the country. So, Roman has been joining us via Zoom for the last several months, sometimes in hotels, sometimes from an apartment, sometimes from an air raid shelter, um, and working day to day to document how information narratives have been used to make a case for Putin to, to engage in a war of aggression against his country. He can't join us in person, but he can join us virtually. And so I'm very excited to welcome Roman Osadchuk to the virtual stage. Now, now Roman, I, I wish so badly that you could be here in person, but we do the best we can because it's so important for you to be able to tell the story of your work and what you've been experiencing in Ukraine. None of this is particularly new in many ways because uh, the Kremlin has been targeting Ukraine with narratives for many years. Uh, there have been many attempts that are ongoing to dehumanize Ukrainians, to essentially portray them as less than human. Um, how has Putin weaponize dehumanization, and what have been the consequences of that? Thank you, Andy. Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, thank you for the great introduction, and now uh, to your question. So, <clears throat> since the Soviet Union collapsed, um, Russia tried to build up some kind of uh, cooperation between the neighboring countries and ex-Soviet Union parts, but it was always not the union of the equal. It was rather uh, one primary actor, Russia, and smaller, uh, smaller, not, uh, I don't know, not that ideal Russia's elsewhere that should be, I don't know, joined by uh, with their Western cultures and not actually uh, the ones that actually should decide on anything. So since 2014, when Ukraine, when Ukrainians actually protested against uh, ex-president decision to um, not to sign an agreement with the uh, European Union, uh, Russia launched an avalanche of different disinformation against Ukrainians, uh, trying to deny the actually an existence of existence of Ukraine as a country and Ukrainians as people. Uh, trying to demonize them, dehumanize them, uh, portray them as, uh, as, as as bad as possible for internal and external audiences. Uh, sometimes with uh, absolutely imagery stories like the crucified boy, um, the notorious example of the disinformation, or putting the blame for the things that were actually made by pro-Russian proxies like the MH17 dummy. And what we see now is that all of this dehumanization throughout the first 24 years after the Soviet Union collapse, uh, setting the stage that Ukrainians are not worthy and they are lesser people, and then full-on propaganda machine against the Ukraine that 
actually Ukrainians are bad, they are Nazi, or and many, many, many other disinformation narratives. They actually led to the atrocities uh, that we could see and actually, uh, unfortunately, are bound to uncover even more in places like Mariupol, where the maternity ward uh, was shelled, uh, the uh, massacre in Bucha, and many, many other places when actually Russians doing horrible things to Ukrainians, partially because they were taught that Ukrainians are not equal to them. So over the course of the year leading up to the invasion, we tracked Russian troop movements, exercises uh, in Belarus, um, uh, aggressive narratives being portrayed through Kremlin media, um, growing at a fairly steady pace. And somewhere around 90 days, it seems, before the invasion, there was a spike in, uh, for lack of a better name, false flag narratives. These claims that Ukraine was engaging in attacks or were preparing to attack uh, Russia. And this would allow the Kremlin to say that they were defending themselves. What did you observe over that period in terms of false flags? Uh, yeah, we actually published quite a bunch of the stories and reports on those false flags uh, and how they disseminated across Russian media. But some of them uh, were actually, um, I don't know, extremely laughable by the people who understand the situation and basically are bound to the fact check, uh, at least we had the Google, Google search or something, because uh, they were aimed at both uh, external audiences and internal audiences, but Honestly, no um, large institution or respectable institution or media on the West actually believed into them. So the things like Ukrainians are building bio labs. Uh, so this like never dying narrative that is at least seven years old, and uh, things uh, things like that. Ukraine would attack um, Russia even though they amassed more than one hundred thousand troops near the Ukrainian borders, which actually even from the logical standpoint seems incredible, but still, uh, mainly they were for the consumption of the internal audience of Russia and Russians abroad, because I don't know any people uh, and media uh, that actually believe this, uh, uh, because we caught uh, Kremlin speakers and pro-Kremlin proxies on lies multiple times. Uh, like one notable uh, example is that um, one week prior to the invasion on the February 18th, um, so-called republics, TNR and LNR, um, announced evacuation because there was like some emergency that Ukraine is about to attack or something like this. And the metadata of those files actually proved that those videos were pre-recorded a few days before. So it was premeditated action, not because it responds to some action and some ongoing situation, but something that was premeditated in advance. And yeah, those things just show that there was a huge spike in different narratives just to prepare people that Ukraine is behaving badly. Uh, so I'm using air quotes here a lot, but it's basically a narrative that they try to portray for their internal audience. So they need to do something so to justify their um, decision to invade. But most of them actually crumble under the few Google search or just basic fact checking, nothing more. Roman. Uh, you clearly have internet connection right now, and you're live, and so so there's that. Uh, but uh, you've been running capacity building programs from various undisclosed locations, including underground locations at random time points. Right, a number of the digital Sherlock's have seen Roman and uh, with stranger backgrounds than per usual. Uh, and while we were in the green room just now talking about it, it, touching base, checking in like we always do on A, like A how everything is going, uh, B, what you're up to today, uh, I, there were air raid sirens going on. So how are you doing? What's going on right now? Uh, they're still up. Um, so um, actually, everybody should take a shelter as of now, um, or at least hide between two walls. Um, so that's basic, the basic drill that every Ukrainian know as of now is that you, uh, when there is like some air raid sirens, you need to hide uh, behind two walls if you cannot reach the shelter or go to the shelter. Uh, but yeah, uh, because of the um, 21st century uh, and all the uh, luxuries that technologies bring us, I could be with you now 
talk to you um, over the internet, um, discuss uh, the malign narratives while simultaneously uh, hide um, from the possible shelling that might occur. We're going to bring up a few other colleagues right now, but it's good to see you, man. I'm glad that you can join, and, uh, and we miss you. Thank you for having me, and uh, miss you too. Thanks, Roman. Stay safe, please. So Roman is part of a team of more than half a dozen researchers that have been focusing specifically on tracking narratives coming from the Kremlin going back over the last year and even before that. And so right now, I'd like to welcome uh, Ingrid Dickinson and, and Nika Alexeyeva um, to talk about some of the research we've been doing, specifically on how Kremlin narratives have been dispersed and weaponized on the Telegram network. Ukrainians are Russophobic Nazis. Ukraine military men are violent to their own citizens. And the West is not looking forward to welcome Ukraine. These were the most common narratives Kremlin media was consistently pushing for all these eight years. We reviewed 3,000 or 3,000 fact checks and debunks done by Stop Fake. Ukrainian fact-checking organization. And at first, of course, we noticed many manufactured false accusations, miscontextualized videos and photos, staged events and provocations, as well as fake testimonies to portray Ukraine as bad as possible. Then, in May 2014, Minsk agreement was signed. And this information turned more nuanced. We could see more manipulations, distortions. But throughout these eight years, many things have happened, many events, processes, and it all brought new opportunities for new lies. Euromaidan. Kremlin media would say, oh, that's a Western manufactured strive for democracy. Shooting at the Maidan. It's by, done by the protesters themselves to frame Yanukovych's riot, riot police. Language reforms in Ukraine. They are driven by Russophobia, according to the Kremlin. Neglecting the fact that Ukraine is a sovereign country with their own unique language. Downing of MH17. Kremlin blamed anyone else besides their own military, including Ukraine, to suggest that Ukrainians did it to blame Russian. And of course, the most importantly, Eurovision. <laughs> that was what Kremlin media was worried the most, suggesting that Ukrainians are broke and that they will never host the song contest. COVID-19, of course, also played its role in the disinformation spread. But Kremlin used any other disease as an opportunity to spread panic. Think of tuberculosis, hepatitis A, AIDS, cholera, measles, and even plague. Recently, we noticed surge of the narrative about the US biolabs in Ukraine. Well, actually, it dates back to at least 2017, when Kremlin media was writing U.S. is turning Ukraine into a biological bomb. Now we see how all these disinformation narratives build up to a distorted worldview and help to justify the war in Ukraine. Now I'll welcome Ingrid to brief us more about the research we were doing. Thanks. Thank you, Nika. Um, so today, DFR Lab wants to preview a project that we've been working on that involves the collection of distinct events highlighted by the Russian media and the Kremlin over the time period of December 17th, 2021, up until the start of the invasion on February 4th, 24th, 2022. Um, <laughs> some examples of these events would be things along the lines of say, a Russian official saying that Ukrainians are Nazis in a speech, 
um, or allegations of Ukraine intentionally shelling civilians. Keywords for these events were selected and then searched via SMAT, uh, which is a research platform that has archived over 500 Russian language telegram channels related to the war in Ukraine. Um, we did this in order to identify the spread and engagement that each event received. We picked December 17th as the start date for this collection period because this was the day that Russia released a list of security guarantees that NATO needed to comply with in order to, according to Russia, reduce tensions in Europe. Um, this included things along the lines of barring Ukraine from joining NATO and returning NATO forces to their 1997 positions. Uh, fortunately for you all, we don't have time to walk you through all 70-something of the events that we've collected. Um, however, we did identify four broad categories that we felt encompassed the vast majority of these and provided some insight into Russia's information campaign and its progression. Um, these four categories are, firstly, um, claims that NATO and the U.S. were provoking Russia um, and escalating tensions in Europe. Let's see, I haven't used this yet. <laughs> okay. Well, I think you all got a, a little accidental preview earlier of some of our graphs, um, so hopefully we've seen that. But uh, the second category includes uh, allegation of Ukraine's current or potential use of biological, chemical, and or nuclear weapons. Uh, the third category is made up of allegations of human rights abuses and corruptions uh, in Ukraine to include things like Nazism and Russophobia, uh, as well as actions of the Ukrainian government against its people. And then the final category is comprised of alleged military provocations on behalf of Ukraine, uh, many of which have already been debunked or proved to be false flags. So we've split up the data into these four categories. Um, as you can see, one example here um, of the Ukrainian involvement with chemical, biological, and or nuclear weapons. Um, really to help us start visualizing what the Russian information space was looking like at various points throughout this collection period. Um, basically, looking at this progression over time, uh, we found that Russia's information campaign began with more intermittent and intangible claims against the West and Ukraine. Um, and over time, especially in the final weeks before the invasion, intensified into more concrete and sensational allegations of things along the lines of uh, military provocations or abuses that were being shared many times a day on Telegram. Um, this increase in frequency of these accusations and their levels of engagement was most noticeable in the final week leading up to the invasion. Um, this is all just preliminary data that we have in the meantime, but DFR Lab plans to release further research in the future on this, um, so keep an eye out for that. I'll hand it back to Nika. Thank you, Ingrid, very much. So to conclude, we see that Kremlin used these eight years to create narratives completely based on lies. Fact checkers disinformation researchers, open source investigators, and media literacy trainers. They did a great job to prepare Western audiences. But Russia's audience is beyond our reach. The current media landscape in Russia makes it almost impossible to reach a regular person in Russia's countryside watching television every evening. Telegram is almost the only remaining platform which makes it theoretically possible that this person will go and read a channel by independent Russian media pushed in exile. But not if Kremlin has already primed its audience. Our aim with this research is to understand how Kremlin lies are being disseminated and amplified. And we hope that it will help us to understand how to win the information war that has been, is, and will continue even when the arms are put down. Thank you. <laughs>